Hey everybody, I'm Cliff in for CCB. This morning at the WCARES monthly meeting on July the 20th, 2024, I did a presentation on the antennas that are on the uh, Public Safety Center building in Williamson County here. Uh, those are the antennas that WCARES uses for our Aries group. And I, I did a, a pretty brief presentation and I kind of rushed through a few things. I am now home and I'm recording this for our YouTube channel. So I'll have a little more time to get into some details that I didn't have this morning. So I'm going to load up my PowerPoint and uh, let's just jump into it. We're going to talk about what antennas are actually installed at the PSC for our use, where the antennas are physically located, the performance by band for each of our antennas, where does the antenna coax enter the building, where do the antennas terminate in the building. We'll talk about antenna routing and just a spoiler alert, there are two patch panels, if you will. There's one in the Oxcom room where our radios are located. And then there's another one that's actually a bus bar, which just, you know, works just like a patch panel that's over in the fire safety room. And we can patch things between those two rooms and uh, to classrooms and other things. So we'll talk a lot about that. I'll give you two routing examples. And then uh, if you have any questions, you can shoot me an email and I'll give you my email address at the end. All right. We've got six antennas for HF. There's a Mosley beam that's a six band antenna. Uh, that was a recent discovery. I always thought that was just a 20, 15, and 10 meter antenna, but it's actually got the work bands uh, and six meters there uh, as well. So a great surprise for a great antenna. We have a hex beam, uh, which has five bands. A lot of hex beams will have a six meter kit and we don't have that six meter wire apparently. We have two Alpha Delta DXCC antennas. Um, we have another Alpha Delta antenna that is the low band version, the DXLB Plus, which has 160 meter capability. And then we have uh, actually two Tenodyne antennas. One of them is dedicated to the Shares uh, Windlink system that's not really an amateur uh, frequency uh, bands. But we do have two of these Tenodyne broadband antennas that are used for Windlink. We have four VHF UHF antennas, and they're used for Winlink, DMR, VHF UHF voice, and APRS. There are three antennas on one tower for Winlink, VHF UHF voice, and APRS. I'm not sure where the DMR antenna is physically located, but the body of the radio is up in the radio room, and just the control head is found in the Oxcom room. Uh, here is an overhead view of the Public Safety Center. And there are actually five towers that are, are, are enumerated or, or, or lettered. I don't know what the right word for that is. Uh, but we've got, starting from the front here, Tower A. Back in the back left, we have Tower B, which has no WCARES antenna. So let's just ignore that one. Tower C in the front here has the VHF antennas installed. Tower D back on the back right has our hex beam. While researching this, I saw that we have a VHF UHF antenna mounted on the tower back there at Tower D with the hex beam. I'll show you a picture of it here. Uh, that that antenna does not come down to the Oxcom room with the uh, hex beam. So I think it's possible that that is the antenna that's used in the radio room for the DMR radio, but I'm not certain about that. Uh, if I didn't mention that the Mosley beam is on Tower A, and then across the parking lot to the right, you'll see the generator building. And there's actually a tower there uh, that uh, I don't believe it has any antennas on it, but it, it is a, a place for us to terminate some wire antennas at height. So that's what that's used for. Now, as far as where these antennas are located, uh, let's start in the center. There's the Mosley beam uh, right there on tower A. Hanging uh, off the Mosley beam tower is the ends of two DXCC antennas. The one on the left is labeled North-South DXCC. That one truly does, uh, the wire runs north to south. And as you know, the most signal comes off of a dipole antenna from the broadside. So the North-South antenna is what you would want to use if you wanted to work, uh, have a stronger signal to the east and to the west. Uh, to the right of the North-South antenna, we have an East-West DXCC. Now this is not a 90 degree angle. This antenna does not run truly east to west. It's more southeast to northwest, something like that. Uh, but it also is a DXCC. Uh, back in the back left, up at the top, you'll see the hex beam. 
that's on tower D and attached to tower D is one end of the LB plus antenna the other end runs across the parking lot to the uh, generator building tower up front on the right uh, you've got a tower that's tower C that has uh, the UHF VHF antennas all three antennas are mounted on that one tower and then finally there's a tenodyne antenna that's attached to that tower tower C where the VHF UHF antennas are uh, one end is attached to that the other end is attached to the tower at the generator building okay so that's where they're physically located there's a tower there's a, there's a, there's a antenna here that's not shown and that is another tenodyne antenna after looking at some photos it looks like that tenodyne antenna across the roof is going from tower C where the VHF antennas are back to the back left corner at tower B okay I'll briefly cover the specs on the so what I what I did as I I for each ham band I went down to where the SWR was two to one uh, and going lower than that would result in the SWR increasing and I did the same thing on the upper end I kept going through the ham band until uh, the SWR was two to one or greater and I stopped so uh, you can see that all of the bands are entirely covered here uh, on the 10 meter wire the 10 meter section I guess I should say of this beam antenna uh, it doesn't go down to 28 megahertz at the start of the 10 meter band uh, so it's still usable with a tuner but if you're doing CW or digital uh, it's not optimal uh, so I wrote in the comment section this favors sideband favors SSB the hex beam covers all the entire bands within two to one and there's no six meter wire kit for the Alpha Delta DXCC the one that runs north to south um, it could use a little love uh, it does favor sideband on the 8 meter band it's not tuned down to the lower you know where CW and digital is so it does favor sideband um, on the 40 meter band it starts a little bit below the band and it doesn't quite reach to the upper part of 40 meters where uh, there's still some sideband up to I think 7.3 megahertz um, so it kind of favors digital CW 20 meter band uh, doesn't go all the way down to 40, 14 where the band starts so I say it does favor sideband 15 meters it's actually below the band so we're using the 40 meter antenna on the third harmonic of that to, to uh, work the 15 meter band and because of that the 15 meter uh, frequency where it's 2 to 1 or, or better is below the start of the 15 meter band which starts at 21 megahertz now this is very common for any kind of dipole that uses a 40 meter wire and uses that to work 15 meters uh, the antenna is not going to be quite right for that but perfectly usable with with a tuner uh, on the 10 meter wire here uh, you can see that this 10 meter wire is really too short if you think about it you know antennas get smaller as the frequency increases right so down there at 28.635 megahertz the band actually starts at 28.0 and so because the antenna does better the higher the frequency that means that the antenna is too short and we, sh we we could go in there and solder a little bit of extra wire onto both sides of that dipole on the 10 for the 10 meter wire to lower the resonant frequency to be something better but still usable but not optimal the east to west alpha delta dxcc antenna it's got the same kind of issues uh, that the other one did you know some bands are great some bands are favored on one mode or the other but that's that's how it works out right there what you see the lb plus this antenna is uh surprisingly not great uh we use it for the cw station on field day we make a lot of contacts with it i don't want to disparage this antenna but at you know for whatever reason at the height that it's uh, deployed or or some metal or something that might be nearby i don't know uh, but at 160 meters uh, we've got three to one on the upper and lower not two to one and there's just a very small segment of this high Q 160 meter band where the SWR is is 2.3 to one so perfectly usable with an with a tuner but because it uses coils to physically shorten this antenna uh, it's high Q and so there's only a small piece that's uh, that's really decent 80 meters kind of has the same issue uh, 
it's only the the best it does is 2.5 to 1 um, at sideband really uh, so it's usable with a tuner but not not that awesome 40 meters fine doesn't quite make it up to 40 meters uh, sideband all the way to the top it almost does um, 20 meters fine 15 meters this one favors uh, sideband it doesn't get down to 21.0 at uh, SWR of 2.1 Two to one, I mean. And I can't explain. I can't explain this because I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this antenna is using the 40 meter wire for uh, the third harmonic. I and mean, normally you'd see that uh, it's a little below the band, but uh, this one is a little, a uh, little higher. So I can't explain that. I'm not smart enough to to know why that is. 10 meter band. Uh, here's a case where the antenna wire is definitely uh, too short. Uh, you know, the 10 meter band starts at 28 megahertz, and this one is 2 to 1 at almost 29 megahertz. So, we really could uh, use adding some wire to that antenna to lower it a little bit. Uh, it's, 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 it's nearly a 1 megahertz higher in frequency than it really should be. All right, the Tenodyne. Now, the Tenodyne is a mystery antenna. We've got two of these, they're both used for Windlink, they're, they're broadband antennas. And it's hard to believe, but as the comment there in the middle says, I measured SWR of 2 to 1 or better all the way from 1.44 megahertz, which is below the 160 meter band, to 9.3, which is above the 40 meter band, almost 30 meters. 2 to 1 SWR or better for 8 megahertz of bandwidth. That's incredible. Uh, the entire bands are covered by 2015 and almost the entire band for, for 10 meters. I will say this, we use them for wind link, but we tried to use these antennas for a uh, field day a few years ago, and they were like dummy loads. We weren't making any contacts. I have no idea why that is. Uh, on paper, this looks fantastic, but we did not get the results uh, th that we expected, and so I have to put a question mark on this antenna. Maybe we should do some, uh, do some work with it to, to try it out to see uh, you know if somebody's hearing us on a web SDR receiver in some other part of the country but anyway it's a uh, hoop this morning uh, made the suggestion that it was kind of an antenna that, that was like a dummy load um, how does coax get into the building all right so there's two of these one is all the antennas on the roof come in a certain way and then the antennas from the parking lot come in a different way for the antennas on the roof all eight of them come through the ceiling of the radio room the picture on the left here is the smiling Jeff Stanifer, WB5WAJ, who's holding the door open so I can take a picture uh, to show you that it's radio room uh, 211 upstairs in the, in, the, uh, w, in the public safety center. On the right, you can see bundles of coax coming from the roof. Um, you see my mouse here. So coax is coming in. We've got a copper uh, bus uh, strip right here where a lot of grounding is taking place. We've got, I believe, some polyphasers here where some lightning protectors are being used. Uh, there's a halo wire that's running through the building that does grounding uh, here up on the second floor. I do not know much about the grounding, uh, but this is a, uh, a very highly technical commercial you know, installation. I'd be surprised if the grounding wasn't amazing. But that's how the coax gets in from all the antennas on the roof. Uh, all of these antennas, these eight antennas, all terminate in the OXCOM room. That's where our radios are. You can get to every antenna on the roof at the patch panel in the OXCOM room. That's what the patch panel looks like. Now, I realize this is kind of daunting, but we're going to talk more about this and remove some of the mystery. But I will tell you that those eight jacks on the top row right there, those are all the eight antennas. So if you're in the radio room and you want to connect your radio to one of those antennas, you can just... You know, take one of those cables and plug it directly into your radio and have direct access to those eight antennas on the roof. All right. The second way that antennas, uh, coax gets into the building are for the antennas that are in the side parking lot. There is a lamp post in the side parking lot that has a junction box. And there's three coax runs, three cables in that box that go through conduit under the parking lot and terminate in a bus bar in the fire safety room. The fire safety room is the room that's labeled FACP, which stands for Fire Alarm Control Panel. Every commercial building has a, has a room somewhere with FACP on it, as far as I know. And that's where our fire safety room is. That's where our bus bar is. 
uh, that takes these this coax from the from the parking lot. There are three cables there. Currently, we're only using two of them: one for the DXLB Plus, and then one for the Tenodyne Windlink machine. There is an unused connection. So let's talk about what this looks like. All right, on the right, you'll see over here the junction box that's at the bottom of this light pole. If you look up here at the top, this is the Windlink antenna that's used by the Shares machine. Shares is uh, is Windlink, but it's outside the amateur band. It's uh, more of a governmental uh, thing, uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, there's also some coax coming to the pole from over here. That is from the LB Plus antenna that runs between the hex beam that's back off screen here and the generator building behind me where I was standing to take this picture. The coax travels under the parking lot and over here to the fire safety room. And it terminates at a bus bar that's in the fire safety room. First, the junction box. The cables from the parking lot antennas come up through the bottom of this junction box. This is a waterproof box. You can see the O-ring here to keep it uh, dry. But the cables come up underneath through this hole. And I should mention that because there's a hole here, I don't think I've ever opened this box without there being some wasps or like wasp nest in this box. The day, a few days ago when I took this picture, there was nothing in there but some spider webs. Uh, but having this big hole here uh, probably should be sealed with some foam sealant or something to, to try to keep the bugs out. But regardless, the coax comes up through this, connects to these three connectors on this side of the little bus bar here. You can see that the one on the top right is unused. There's nothing connected to it. And then there's the lightning protector here. And then the three cable runs go down through this conduit and under the parking lot. You'll probably see right here on the label that says blue, red, and green. We'll talk more about these color schemes in just a second. All right, so let's see where this the, these three coax cables terminate. This is inside the fire safety room. Here's the bus bar. There are 10 positions here on this bus bar. They're all filled. And these three cables that are coming up from the bottom, these are screwed into jacks. Notice how they all have purple. This color code is the location. All three of these are coming from the parking lot. These three are brown. All three of those are going to the same destination, which is classroom 134. And these four have white as the first color. Those all go to the OXCOM room. And those are used to send signals back and forth between the OXCOM room and the fire safety room. So this is what it looks like when it comes into the building. There is a cable here with this blue and brown that you can see is coming into here. It's not coming into the bottom. That's because we've only got 10 positions and there's actually 11 things that we need to plug in. So this, this cable right here runs over to the Windlink uh, equipment room uh, next to classroom 134 where the share system uh, is running in that little closed room. Um, if we had another position here, we would have plugged this cable into the bottom and then we'd be able to use jumpers to you know, move them. But anyway, this just, just be aware there are 10 things plugged in here, but there's actually 11 things. And this one is kind of an anomaly. It's just a cable, you know, that's kind of hanging free by itself. All right. So for antenna routing, there are two places. We've already mentioned these, the OXCOM room and the fire safety room. There's a patch panel in the OXCOM room that can see all eight of the roof mounted antennas. It can uh, run cables. There's four jacks that go to the fire safety room. They're used to route signals between uh, the classroom and the parking lot and things like that. The OXCOM room patch panel can see the EOC wall jack. There's a jack on the, on the wall right outside the media briefing room. And on the other side of that wall, there's the media briefing room that has a jack in there. So you can send antennas, connect antennas uh, from the OXCOM room to, directly to the EOC wall jack or the media briefing room or send it over to the fire safety room for further routing. So the bottom half of this slide, the bus bar in the fire safety room can see the three coax cables coming from the side parking lot. The wind link equipment room, remember that's that cable that's just kind of there by itself that runs directly to the wind link equipment room. It can see classroom 134. There are three antenna jacks in classroom 134. Uh, there are no jacks in the adjacent classroom, by the way, just the three and 134. We have at times, uh, use the adjacent classroom to for a station and we just had a long cable 
like a like a 50 foot or 100 foot coax cable uh, from from classroom 134 into I think it's 133. Finally, the uh, bus bar in the fire safety room has the jacks that correspond to the same jacks in the oxcom room. Now, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I'm about to show you the thousand word picture right now. This gives you a great visual of the two patch locations and what they can see. So over here in the Oxcom room, this patch panel, it can see all eight antennas directly. Remember those all come up on the top row of that patch panel. There's a jack for the media briefing room and there's a jack uh, that you can use to send signals uh, or, or get things from the, from the wall jack in the EOC. There's also these four jacks that let you send and receive things to the fire safety room. So this little conduit here, these four things uh, allow you to pass things back and forth. Over here in the fire safety room on that bus bar, it can see these three parking lot antennas. It can see the three jacks that are in room 134. And there's a cable that goes to the wind link equipment room in addition to the four you know, jacks here. So that's what, that's how this whole thing is laid out. If you take nothing away from this talk, just understand that this diagram shows you what can be directly connected to what and what has to be routed. So for example, if you wanted one of these parking lot antennas to go to class 130, 134, great. You just install a jumper between the antenna that you want and the position on the bus bar of whichever jack you want to send that signal to in the room 134. But if you want to send that same antenna that's in the parking lot to the EOC wall jack, you've got to take you got to take that uh, antenna output there and make a jumper to one of these four uh, auxiliary, you know, the Oxcom uh, room patch panel jacks. And now the signal is going to be over here and you're going to take a jumper and go from that jack to, say, the EOC wall jack. And now you're taking this antenna from the parking lot all the way th through this conduit to the wall jack. I hope that makes sense. Uh, but this this diagram is uh, really helps you get your head around this, so very helpful. I hope. All right, let's talk about the color coding. So when this building was built in 2016, there are a lot of coax runs, right? And so what the contractor did, who who ran all this coax cable, is they use a color coding to group these coax by location, and then a second color to indicate the individual wire. So. Uh, we talked a while ago about these three cables that come up from the bottom to the bus bar here in the fire safety room. They all were purple. So purple is the location code. And then underneath that, there's a second piece of tape that has red, green, and blue. Well, do you remember a minute ago when I showed you the junction box? Those things were labeled red, green, and blue up there on the lightning protectors. So that's how you know which cable is which and which cable is going to, you know, to which uh, thing on the other side. Here with the brown color code, that's going to room 134. And there actually is a jack over there with one yellow piece of tape. There's a jack over there with two yellow pieces of tape and a jack over there with, with blue tape. And so that's, those terminate, you know, uh, they start here, they terminate over there. Incidentally, why, why they use two pieces of yellow? This is the only place that I know of in the whole system that doesn't use three different colors. Maybe they didn't have anything but yellow and blue that day. I don't know, but it's kind of weird, but it works. Uh, and again, the white the white cables over here represent the Oxcom room. This one, the tape is a little further down uh, from the jack, but there is a, definitely the first color is white. So these are the th four that correspond to the the, the signal sent over to the Oxcom room. All right. This has been a mystery, but you're about to understand it. This diagram shows you the cable runs that come from these different locations. So the, the tower C is the tower that has the uh, three VHF UHF antennas. And so they all have an orange cable and then these color codes for the individual cables. Uh, tower A has the Mosley beam and the two DXCC antennas. All those cables are gonna have red tape and then one of these colors for the individual cable that represent the different antennas. Uh, finally antenna uh, back in the back right corner of the building where the hex beam is uh, there are two uh, cable runs for that, the hex beam and the uh, the Tenodyne antenna on the roof. Okay, so logically, these are the antennas that come into the Oxcom patch panel. 
you can access all eight of the antennas on the roof right here at the top of the panel. At the bottom of the panel are locations, not antennas necessarily, but just locations where you can route these antennas or where you can get uh, signals that you send to these other antennas from here if you want to. Okay, got that? Top row antennas, bottom row is locations. Now, antenna-wise, specifically, here's how these things are working. These first three antennas are the VHF, UHF antennas that are used for Winlink, APRS, and FM voice. We've got the North-South DXCC here on the fourth jack, the Mosley beam on the fifth, the other DXCC here, and these last two have the hex beam and the roof-mounted Tenodyne antenna. As far as the locations down here, these are physically running from the seventh jack in the fire safety room, eighth, ninth, tenth jack, and then a connection to the EOC wall jack and the media briefing room wall jack. Okay, so antennas and locations. You're about to understand this mess. You may already understand it, but let's talk about it in a little more detail. Here's the diagram that shows you the, the colors of the cables that were pulled and connected here. We got these first three purple ones from the antennas outside. We got these three brown ones that go to room 134. We got these four white ones that run over to the Oxcom room. And up here by itself, this anomaly, because we only have 10 positions, not 11, even though we got 11 sources here. Uh, this is the free hanging cable that currently is plugged in to this jack right here, which you know we all know hopefully by now it's the Tenodyne antenna. These are the antennas from the side parking lot, and they're the LB plus, the unused one, and the Tenodyne. That's how it's currently configured. And then here are the locations. I just talked about those. I won't repeat myself. But the important takeaway here is the antennas are the first three on the left, and then the locations are the other ones. So here's a test for you. We've got two Tenodyne antennas. And they're both used for wind link. One's up on the roof and the other's in the side parking lot. So the question is, how can we figure out which of those two Tenodyne antennas is being used for the shares radio in the equipment wind link room, the room that's next to classroom 134? Which one of those Tenodyne antennas is being used for shares? All right, well, one way to solve this is to remember we're looking for the share system, which is in the wind link equipment room. And there's a cable here uh, that, that runs directly to that room. So we got to start here, right? There's no sense looking at the patch panel in the auxiliary room because that patch panel can't see into the wind link uh, equipment room directly, but we can here. So what we need to do is to find out where this cable is connected. And that's going to tell us which antenna. If this cable is connected directly to the Tenodyne antenna right here, well then boom, there you've got it. It's, it's going to be the antenna, the Tenodyne antenna that's in the parking lot. If instead this cable is connected to one of these four jacks, then we're going to be routing the classroom, the, the Windlink equipment room to the Oxcom room where we're going to patch in the roof mounted Tenodyne. So let's go take a look. All right, here's our answer. So here's the Tenodyne antenna. And you can see that directly connected to that is not a jumper, but it's this cable that comes from uh, the Windlink equipment room. Okay. Uh, those of you who are, are especially astute may notice that these colors on the classrooms over here, uh, they were blue at the top, or excuse me, brown at the top and then colors. There's actually a brown cable with a blue piece of tape here that goes into classroom 134. And they've got the same color scheme here for uh, this room that's adjacent to classroom 134. So I guess we'll give them a pass and we'll just say, well, it's the same color scheme because it's sort of the same location, but that doesn't explain why there's two blue pieces of tape that are duplicates. So I don't know, just, just be aware. All right, second test here. Uh, so we want to make the DXLB plus antenna that's in the side parking lot. We want to take that antenna and make it available to a station that's going to be in the media briefing room. Well, how can we do that? Okay, well, first of all, you should know by now that the DXLB plus antenna is coming in from the parking lot on the side of the building. Okay, so it comes in here. And we need to send this antenna to the media briefing room. Well, you know, we don't have access directly to the media briefing room here from these, from, from these connectors. But what we can do 
is to connect the uh, DXLB Plus by a jumper to one of these four jacks that are going to appear on the control, the, the, the patch panel in the Oxcom room. And from there, we can pass it over to the uh, media briefing room. So let's take a look. Here's the LB Plus antenna coming in from the parking lot. We're going to take a jumper right here and we're going to route it over here and into this jack. This is the first of the four Oxcom room connectors, okay? So that's going to show up on the control panel in the bottom left hand corner. I said control panel, I meant patch panel. In the bottom left hand corner of the uh, Oxcom room. Okay, this is the patch panel diagram from the Oxcom room. You can see where it says FSR7, that's the fire safety room number seven. I'm going to go back for a second. Notice, how, notice here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is jack number seven. It's the first of the four. So I'm going to go forward again. Jack number seven, eight, nine, and ten. So we have connected the LB Plus to jack number seven, which is here. And now we've got to take a jumper and take this signal that is coming to us here and jumper it to the media briefing room. So let's look at that. Here's the LB Plus coming from the fire safety room. Jumpered with this virtual jumper here to the media briefing room right here on this jack. Okay? That's how we do that. And when we do that, now somebody in the media briefing room can connect their radio to that jack in the wall and their signal is going to flow to and from that antenna that's in the side parking lot. Does that all make sense? I hope so. If not, go back and look at that uh, diagram that shows you what can see what. All right, bonus material. I did not talk about this. I did not show this this morning in my presentation because I was kind of time limited. But here's something pretty cool. So we've got two beam antennas, right? The Mosley and the hex beam. Each of those B and beam antennas have a rotator motor that's used to rotate the antennas 360 degrees. There's a motor that's mounted up on the tower and the uh, the the antenna pole, I don't know what the, right, the terminology is here, but but the antenna the, the antennas are mounted on a pole that run through these rotator motors and so they can uh, the motors can turn those antennas clockwise or counterclockwise. But the brains of that is in a a controller box that's inside the Oxcom room. So each, each antenna, the, the Mosley antenna and the hex beam, both have a controller where you can release the brakes to free up the pole and then rotate it counterclockwise or clockwise to reach your desired uh, you know, compass uh, direction. So the question is, are those antennas just limited to being able to be used in the Oxcom room? Or is it possible for us to take those controllers out of the room and use those controllers in the on the EOC floor or the media briefing room. Hmm. Well, the fact that I'm asking you this question means that there yes, it can be done. So I'm going to show you how it can be done. In the Oxcom room, you find both of those controllers. And right now, the cables coming down from the motors are plugged into the back of the controllers, okay? But there's actually a cable a control cable that's running between the Oxcom room through the wall over to the EOC uh, floor jack. If you take the panel off the wall, you can see inside there that there's, of course, the jack that's plugged into the panel. But behind that, behind that panel in the wall is a, um, a controller cable. So what we can do is, for example, say the Mosley beam. We can unplug the cable out of the back of the controller and we can plug it into the end of the uh, remote control cable that runs through the wall. And now when we take the panel off, we can screw, uh, we, can, we, can, we can take another control cable, plug it in there, and plug that into the back of the controller and use it on the table out in the EOC. Or you could just run it in, run the long cable uh, into the uh, media briefing room. We've done that for field day. So yes, you can actually take those controllers out of the Oxcom room and use them on the EOC floor or the media briefing room and patch those two antennas 
to the uh, EOC floor or the media briefing room and actually use them one at a time because we only have one cable running for the controllers out of the Oxcom room. But it is possible. That's pretty cool. If you have questions uh, about these antennas or the way things are routed, just uh, send me an email, batsoncliff at gmail.com. And if I don't know the answer, I'll find someone who does and get back to you. Thanks again. Have a great day.